The greatest mysteries of the 20th century include the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa, the JFK assassination, and the Alcatraz prison escape. In 1962, three inmates escaped from Alcatraz Island Federal Penitentiary. This was thought to be impossible. Their bodies were never found, and they were never captured. Until recently, there was a $1 million reward for information that led to the capture or discoveries of the bodies of Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin, who escaped on June 11, 1962. No one knows if they drowned in the chilly waters off Alcatraz that night or truly made it off the rock. Recently, a new document was uncovered, a deathbed confession of a low-level criminal claiming involvement in the escape, which sent Art Roderick, the head of the US Marshals, and his partner, Mike Earp, descendant of legendary lawman Wyatt Earp, cross-country with filmmaker Daniel Zarelli to investigate the oldest open case in U.S. Marshals history. I really don't know how to start this, except to just tell it. I guess you could say I'm a very famous person. It's just that no one knows who I am or what I did. I, along with a man named Robert Michael Kyle, helped to pull off one of the most famous prison escapes in the United States history. There was a lot of people involved in the escape from Alcatraz prison. I know for a fact that high-ranking guards were paid for their part in the escape. I believe from what the convicts told us, that the prison officials had to know or strongly suspect that guards at the prison took part in this escape. On Monday, June 11, with Robert at the wheel, we picked up escaped inmates Frank Lee Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin. We took them north to Seattle on the boat. In the first two or three years after the prison escape, my uncle Donald, the one that got me involved in the escape, said that the convict's family members called him wanting to know what happened. I always told my uncle Donald that me and Robert left the convicts in Canada and never saw them again. I don't think he really ever believed me. Please forgive me for what I did. The spoon proves mightier than the bars of supposedly escape-proof Alcatraz prison. Three bank robbers serving long terms scratched their way through grills covering an air vent, climbed a drainage pipe, and disappeared from the forbidding rock in San Francisco Bay. It appears to be the first successful escape in the history of the maximum security prison. And the flight is attributed by Warden Olin Blackwell to the deteriorating condition of the prison, crumbling concrete and eroding metals with five million needed for repairs. The men the walls couldn't hold are Frank Morris and John and Clarence Anglin. Authorities believe that Morris, who has a superior IQ, masterminded the escape. Ironically, the wanted posters offer only the nominal reward of $50 each for information leading to the arrest of the prisoners. They painstakingly fashioned dummies of plaster with hair of paintbrush bristles to stand in for them during cell check while they covered an escape hole with a cardboard grill. All of this was within easy visual range of the guards in the gun galleries. 
climbed drain pipes to the top of the cell block and then slid down vents to the ground. Again, all of this within sight of guards. The escape triggered the greatest manhunt in San Francisco's history as agents of the FBI, Coast Guardsmen, Highway Patrol, Sheriff's deputies, and local police joined in the search. Whatever their fate, the three convicts have apparently accomplished a feat that many have tried with no success. For most, the name Alcatraz evokes images of iron bars, hard concrete, and brutal guards. A purgatory for anyone trapped inside. Although this is what Alcatraz became, it started as something very different. Isla de los Alcatraces, or Pelican Island, was first surveyed in 1847. Devoid of any real natural resources and only one or two landable beaches, it seemed an unlikely asset to the newly acquired Republic of California. The US Army, however, quickly saw the value of the barren rock. Sitting at the heart of the bay, the island was seen as an ideal location for artillery batteries that could protect the recently renamed hamlet of San Francisco. In 1853, construction began on Camp Alcatraz. Completed in 1859, the island became the first permanent harbor fortification on the United States' west coast. Declaration of Civil War in 1861 left California fighting on the side of the northern states. 300 Union soldiers were stationed at Fort Alcatraz to fend off any possible Confederate assault on the San Francisco Bay. These soldiers waited for an attack that never came. Never once did the cannons of Alcatraz fire on an enemy. The camp did, however, find its use during the war. It began serving as a military prison for captured Confederate soldiers and sympathizers. It continued to operate as both fort and military prison for another 40 years. In 1900, it was decided that the fort would resign all defensive duties and would operate solely as an army prison. Over the next 30 years, the inmates at Pacific Branch U.S. Military Prison Alcatraz transformed the rock, as they called it, into the world's largest and most modern prison. Finally, in 1934, the War Department said goodbye to Alcatraz and handed the island over to the Department of Justice, where it remained until its closure in 1963. This is the era that the island prison is most famous for. The worst of the worst of all maximum security prisons. The most difficult time that any inmate could do. Alcatraz Island Federal Penitentiary. In its almost 30 years as an operational facility, Alcatraz was home to the nation's most dangerous and notorious criminals. Gangsters like Chicago crime boss Al Capone and Los Angeles-based mafioso Mickey Cohen both found themselves locked inside the walls of The Rock. Other most wanted criminals like Machine Gun Kelly and Doc Barker were also sent to Alcatraz. A veritable laundry list of the nation's most famous criminals declared residence on the rock at one time or another. Given the miserable conditions at Alcatraz, combined with the nature of its inmates, it was inevitable that there would be escape attempts. However, in its 29 years of operation, Alcatraz claims that no prisoner ever successfully escaped. This is the Alcatraz prison escape statement. And I faxed it to both the FBI and the U.S. Marshals, and they've deemed it credible enough for follow-up. So two U.S. Marshals and a tracker and myself are actively looking for the site that's mentioned in this statement. I am typing this statement from my good friend and patient, John Leroy Kelly, who was born near Greenville, Mississippi, on or about September 3rd, 1944. He says that he does not have a birth certificate on file, and he never learned to write much more than his name, and states that he cannot read at all. 
John has asked me not to release this to anyone until he is dead. He is afraid of going to jail or prison for the part he played in the 1962 Alcatraz prison escape of Frank Morris, Clarence Anglin, and John Anglin. We get in these type leads we look to say you know we can't say okay this is it it's a home run is this possible and this one's possible so that's why we're here we weren't involved the marshal service as an agency wasn't involved in this case when it first for 18 happened. years right right we didn't get it until 1979 80 80 when the attorney general uh, made the Marshal Service responsible for what they call the escape and rescue statutes, which are the federal statutes that uh, an individual is charged with for escape or aiding and abetting an escape and all that. So that, ca that case came over to us uh, when the Attorney General gave us that authority, more or less moved it from the FBI to us. So we, have, we didn't go back and like try and recreate the right. investigation because let me tell you, the Bureau 1,700 did, pages. They did a lot of <laughs> right. stuff. I mean, surveillances, interviewed family members. Year after year, they went back and, I mean, they did a perfect, a real good investigation. Um, so we weren't going to go back and recreate that. Right. Uh, basically, what we've done up to this point is if something comes up, right. we'll follow the lead out till the end. Thousands of people visit Alcatraz Island every year to see Al Capone sail and hear about the Birdman of Alcatraz. They come to see how Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers escaped. What they hear are the tour-guided facts, a rehearsed and recited account based on speculation as to how the escape actually happened. Never before has Alcatraz revealed everything that it knows and doesn't know about what happened that fateful night. So I just got off the phone with Art, apparently Craig at the Rangers office at Alcatraz called to verify if Art was working with us on the Alcatraz statement. And Art told the guy to give them, Daniel and Neil, all access to everything they have on Alcatraz. When I talked to the U.S. Marshal uh, Service this morning, they indicated that this was the first time that he, Art's been on the case in 12 years, I believe he said, that uh, they had anything really worth pursuing. Uh, they felt that it was, uh, had enough uh, possibilities to dedicate some time to it. Alcatraz was designed and run as a maximum security minimum privilege penitentiary. That meant our inmates received no tailor-made cigarettes, candy bars, chewing gum, soft drinks, radio, television, newspapers, paroles, or rehabilitation programs that none of that might be sent here. In fact, none of our inmates were sent from a court. They're all sent from another prison having a problem. And some told me from the prison that came from, the warden of an institution would have a picture of Alcatraz behind his desk, and he'd point to a picture and say, if I see you one more time, that's where you're going. You are going to Alcatraz. And you knew you are going to do some tough times. Now, you come and visit the island, you look out, you see all these beautiful views, you see San Francisco, the East Bay, Marin County, you say, gee, that's not so bad. But how'd you like to have water held out to you and you can't drink it? You know, it's a city so close and yet so far. Is there any way you think they made it? Uh, at first, I would have said yes, but since they haven't showed up in all these years, I doubt it now. Given the bay and the tide conditions that night and what physical evidence was discovered over the next couple days by the FBI, most of the staff on the island have been of the opinion that they probably didn't survive the swim. I don't think there's been any trace of them found, which in a way is kind of unusual because bodies do turn up in the bay here mostly when somebody drowns. They'll find pieces of them, they'll find parts of their clothes. It's 50 degrees out there for about 10 to 12 Celsius. Uh, it's very cold. Although 400 people a year swim from Alcatraz to San Francisco, we have at least two, maybe three swims a year. Um, most people can't handle it. If you can't do it in 35 or 40 minutes, um, you know, you're going to be in trouble. So it can be done. It's a myth that it can't be done. It's done all the time. One of the stories that's most often been told was that they planned to steal a boat in Angel Island, and given that that didn't happen, that sort of led to a general belief that the chances are that they didn't make it. However, you know, 
We know of many swims, organized swims, that do that bay every year. So we always sort of leave the story with an open end that, well, one never knows. After all, they were pretty highly motivated. Um, you know, at that point that they left their cells that night, at that point, they're escaped convicts. They had nothing left to lose. Once a federal inmate escapes from prison, that becomes an FBI case, apparently. Uh, it comes under their jurisdiction. However, as a fugitive from justice, the U.S. Marshal Service has uh, jurisdiction, too. Um, the Bureau of Prisons would still, of course, you know, potentially be involved in this. Since they are fugitives from the Bureau of Prisons, they would still have time on their original sentences. There's no statute of limitations. Um, so there's various law enforcement agencies should um, evidence pan out and there be more to the story than we now know. Um, there would be several federal agencies ultimately that would probably be interested in it. If you talk to any of the former prisoners, they'll of course all of them say they got away. And if you talk to the former guards, they'll all of them say uh, they're, uh, they're dead, they drowned at sea. But they're still on the wanted list of the FBI, and so they're not going to give up until there's some proof that, uh, that they actually died. Is there any way you think they made it? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, I, I, I helped them with some tools uh, to do that, and uh, I know John and Clarence swam before they could walk. They were born and raised in the Everglades, so I, I, personally, I believe they made it. John has told me that he and a friend helped the three convicts to escape from Alcatraz Federal Prison in San Francisco. At 11.15 p.m. on Monday, June 11th, Robert and I were in a boat off Alcatraz Island Prison. At approximately 10 minutes to midnight, we moved to the area just outside the city marina. At about midnight, I heard splashes in the water. They were lying across a homemade life raft. We picked up escaped inmates Frank Lee Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin. I remember one of the men, Frank Morris, laughed and asked if we were their ride. Robert asked, where was the other two? Frank Morris said, they were it. took them north to Seattle on the boat. When we got back to Bellingham, we had the three convicts get into the back of the truck that we used for painting and had them lie down in the back. Alcatraz had a reputation, I think it was to a large degree deserved of being run more by the book than any other facility. It was part of the reason they created Alcatraz in 1934, because of problems that did exist in other federal prisons. Um, but there's certainly stories of um, payoff. Um, I, I mean, at a low level, you know, there were guards that broke some of the rules, the inconsequential rules, like uh, you weren't allowed to have candy. There was no commissary to buy candy there. Yet there was a correctional officer who worked in the shop that would sometimes slip in and made a piece of candy if they had done a particularly good job on the line. Um, one day, one of those inmates got caught with that candy, and rather than turn the guard in, he did 19 days in solitary, I guess. It may have been more punishment for refusing to inform, because they knew this had to come from correctional staff. We know of, again, um, uh, religious uh, staff on the island that came out here, uh, in at least one case, smuggling letters off the island because they felt the inmates had more of a right to private correspondence with their lawyers than what the law allowed at that time. Craig, one of the rangers here, said that the religious staff sometimes thought that conditions were a little tough and that, that sometimes priests or the religious staff would help give information in letters, bring letters to the families and, and such. Do you know anything about that? No. No, I would say that the religious staff, as I understood it, uh, certainly myself as a part of the religious staff and a priest, the priest that I worked with coming out here, were scrupulous about that. Uh, we were instructed in a number of ways that we were never to take any contraband in or out. Okay. And also, 
There was a no hostage policy. So when we went down into the yard to walk around and talk with them down there, we knew that if they ever grabbed us and captured us in any way at all, the guards on the towers would start shooting. And so you kind of took your life in your hands if you ever did go down in there. But I never ever felt insecure around the prisoners. They were always extremely kind to me and also very respectful of me. And I think part of it had to do with the fact that we were able to get in here from the outside. Very, very few people, including their wives and children, couldn't get into this prison. They talked to them through those walls, you know, with those two inch thick glass windows and through telephones. And we would actually walk in here and we could touch them. They could touch us and they could ask us questions. We'd tell them about the outside world. And, and so we were kind of a breath, and I was, and, and the chaplain service people were a kind of a breath of fresh air for them and, uh, and, and a kind of a bright spot in their life. And they were not about to, to hurt us or take us hostage. I never had any ever experience like that. And I also never heard of any chaplain ever taking contraband in or out. Right. Now, sometimes we took messages in the sense that um, you'd say, uh, well, say hello to my wife or somebody if you knew the person, but, but uh, then you'd just say hello. That was all. Apparently, there was a woman on the outside that was helping make arrangements for their escape. Well, <laughs> that's that's what they said. My uncle, Donald Leroy Robertson, is the one that got me involved in the Alcatraz prison escape. He had been a driver for several big time bank robbers at one time or another in the 1930s and 1940s. And he knew Frank Lee Morris. In October of 1961, my Uncle Donald had me go to San Francisco to meet a woman named Eugenia McGowan in St. Anthony's Catholic Church in the San Francisco Tenderloin District. That day changed my life forever. Many times over the years, I have wished that I had not went to that meeting. She told me that day that five convicts were going to escape from Alcatraz and that she needed me to provide a boat to pick them up and take them to safety. She told me that the convicts' families had come up with over $60,000 to help them escape and that six guards at Alcatraz prison were receiving payoffs to look the other way or to help the convicts. She said, that she was telling me all this so I and my partner Robert would know that the escape would be able to happen without any problems. She gave me 5,000 cash in 20s in an envelope that day, and she was to give me another 5,000 when she found out the exact night the convicts would be able to get out. Eugenia never knew it, but she had sealed the convict's fate when she told me that the convicts would be picking up $50,000. Robert was obsessed with trying to figure out some way to separate the convicts from the $50,000 when we got them back to Seattle. I can't believe now that I went along with Robert's wild scheme. According to all the evidence available, uh, most importantly the FBI's investigation, uh, the point at which uh, the Anglin brothers and Frank Morris went into the bay is just around the corner from the point you see from here. Um, but their choice of location to go into the water it would have been very important to take into account this tower being here. Um, other towers were by and large at the back end and other side of the island. There used to be a tower on the roof of the cell house uh, from which uh, they made their escape from the building. Uh, that had been closed down due to budget cuts and staff shortages uh, years earlier. Okay, here we have the cell house at the top of the island, originally constructed by the Army, and this was a military prison. The Anglins made their escape from an air vent approximately in this area. By all accounts, made their way down here where they were able to slide down an exhaust vent from one of the uh, kitchen stoves down below. This was a uh, the mess hall and food preparation area, and the hospital. Remember, as you look at the island, the plush vegetation all over the island today didn't exist back then. You didn't want a shrubbery this tall in the days that this was a prison. Everything was very low and trim. There were gardens, there were flowers, there were trees, but everything was trimmed in a way to prevent there from being places to hide. Um, but certainly by this time, um, Staffing uh, shortages and uh, budget cuts had an effect on the security. The roof tower had been shut down completely 
there hadn't been a tower on the roof, had that still been there, this escape never could have happened. The road tower would have been the tower over on this side of the island, which according to all the physical evidence is the side of the island that the three left from that night. From the road tower, the view of the point they went into the water uh, would have been right around the corner. On May 11th, I met Eugenia in front of St. Anthony's Catholic Church. We walked to the waterfront, and we met a man in the shadows there. He showed me where the water was likely to carry the convicts on a raft to, and he told me to expect them just after midnight on June 11th. He told me that the convicts would run into no trouble because he was going to make sure that there was no guard in the road tower that night. He said that we should have till 8 a.m. at the earliest to get away before the alarm was sounded. Later on, I discovered that the man we met that night was Alcatraz prison guard, Captain Bradley. I've always wondered how no one ever found out that something wasn't right at Alcatraz prison that night. One thing that Morris figured was sure to get the guards caught was all the things that were hid on top of the cell house. He said that at least 50 to 60 raincoats were used to make the rafts. When two of the convicts didn't take part in the escape, one of the rafts was left on top of the cell house. Morris said that several guards, not just one or two, turned their heads or just didn't say anything about the things they had seen in the weeks leading up to the escape. Frank Morris told us that Captain Bradley gone as far as to order blankets to be hung up over the top of the cell house to keep paint from falling into the cells and the floor below. But the real reason the blankets were put up there was to give the convicts unrestricted access to the rooftop of the cell house and to allow the convicts to escape. I mean, ironically, even though everyone knew those blankets were there, it's not in the official Bureau of Prisons report. The fact that those blankets that were up there are blocking the guards' view of that area on the roof of the cell block, allowing them to make their escape that night, the fact that, that, was, that those sat there for months, arguments amongst the guards, who has authority to okay those blankets being there or not. But what it was is some of the guys coming to the escape worked uh, in the cell house, and they pointed out how badly that area where there's some utility pipes between the top of the cell block and the actual roof of the building was a gap there by design. So each cell block is a building within the cell house, but no part of the cell block touches the exterior surface of the building. Well, they needed some way to work up there to get through the air vents. And so they said, well, we need to paint this area. But look at all the dust and debris and paint chips that are going to be flying around. Gee, can we get some you know, blankets from you know, the army supply that we wash out here and hang them up to contain all the dirt and debris? One correctional officer said, no way. The other one pulled rank and said, no, go ahead. It's, you know, we don't want all that stuff floating around the cell house and people you know, being, you know, being ir I I irritations from this and stuff, so go ahead and do this. How many people do you think knew about the planning of the escape? Everybody. Everybody but the guards. Um, one of the inmates that was in the cell house at the time that was marginally involved in the plan, um, he, the night of the escape, and this is fairly well documented, uh, some tools or other implements were dropped down through the utility cord and bounced off some of the water or sewage pipes that are back in that area. Um, what surprised him was the lack of a response. I mean, these guys were climbing up and down the pipes every night in the backs of other guys' cells. And so uh, they had to make all kinds of arrangements with these people because there was a group of black prisoners that were in here. These were all white guys. And they had to climb, and they were white southern prisoners too, and they were climbing up the backs of these black guys' cells to get up on the roof. Well, it didn't take them very long to figure out what was going on, and so they had to make some compromises and deals with the other prisoners around here, and so word kind of got around and got around and got around. I must say, I was surprised, believe it or not, I was surprised that I didn't know anything about it. The real surprise of the trip came when we got back to my Uncle Donald's house.
He was the one holding the hidden 50,000. We received our 10,000 more, with my Uncle Donald getting 4,000 of the 40. We stayed at Uncle Donald's for over a week. Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers were sure the guards would be arrested and kept listening to the radio and watched the newspapers to see the story about the arrest of the guards. But it never happened. When they read the story in the newspapers that spoons had been used to dig out of the cells, they broke down laughing. They said that shortly before the escape, jackhammers were used to replace the toilets in the cells. The jackhammer was operated by Alan West, who they said had been assigned to prison maintenance since May of 1961. He was allowed to work in the space behind the cells alone because the guards didn't want to get dirty. While he was back there, he used the jackhammer to cut the air vent open. The three convicts said they would have never been able to get out if it hadn't been for Alan West with the jackhammer. Alan West is generally credited with being very involved in the plan and with the escape attempt. Uh, he, his statement to the FBI was the night of the escape, he had trouble opening up the fake air vent that they put over his cell and then trouble getting out. And, um, that's why he didn't escape that night. By the time he got out and up to the roof, the other three were long gone. Have you ever been up there? Be, it's interesting to get on top of the cell block and, and take a look at what they actually did up there, which is phenomenal. Uh, when you see what they had to do uh, under the scrutiny of the guards. We know other inmates that were here that aided and abetted in other ways uh, the escape plan. It was real obvious talking to inmates that were on the island at the time that um, there was a lot of people that were aware of what was going on and in various ways supporting them. June 11th, June 12th, 1962, the escape had occurred the night before, but none of us knew it, and because the masks worked, the dummies worked, you know, we know people that help them with uh, getting the flesh tones right, to add a little rouge to make the cheeks look more realistic, hair from the barbershop, tools and implements from around, the material. I mean, it had to be a significant amount of fabric, raincoat material for their vests and their pontoons that they were using to build some sort of a raft. Out of West, those four men out of West was the most dangerous. He got the men out there. If it wasn't for him, they'd have never gotten to the roof. Alan West is generally credited for being, if you will, one of, one of the main brains behind the escape. You now, others say other things too, but you know, he certainly was involved, um, certainly uh, had an opportunity that night to be the fourth man. But he didn't go in the end, um, and people always wonder why. He was either um, in either couldn't get out of his cell, like he claimed, or he chickened out, take your pick. I kind of thought about the idea that maybe he had decided this was a suicide attempt rather than an escape attempt didn't want to say to the other guys now very involved in this, hey, I don't think it's going to work after all, and maybe just backed out and didn't try to get out that night, knowing that they wouldn't wait for him. Whether or not that's true, I have no reason to know one way or the other, but that seemed like another possible scenario to why he was still in his cell that morning uh, when the other three were long gone. What more could they get, just more time if they were caught trying to escape? What they would have had was probably some time in isolation, um, in D-block at that time. Um, and then certainly time could be added to their uh, sentence uh, for the escape attempt. What is, uh, can you describe what D-Block was like if you were put um, Ironically, it had the best views in the cell house and the largest cells because it was the most recently renovated area. What made D-Block tough was that good view because that was a view of freedom you didn't have. And uh, the fact that you were locked in there 24 hours a day. Uh, um, it, was, it was a larger cell than the regular inmate 
themselves uh, because they were newly renovated in the, the 1940s. But you were on lockdown for 24 hours a day. You didn't have any of the privileges to have a job. which were a lot less than other prisons. Deep Block was, uh, you know, mentally it was a tough time to spend 24 hours a day looking at the same three walls and set bars. While we were at my Uncle Donald's, the three convicts told us that Clarence Carnes had not been able to get out of his cell. and that Alan West had just flat chickened out. He told them he was going all along. Then at the last minute, he told them that he was afraid of the water. He was also concerned that they would get in the water and there wouldn't be any boat out there. They didn't know it, but that made things a lot easier for us the fact that there was three convicts, not five. This week, I arranged for a local priest to start counseling John and hear his confession. It seems to have improved his spirits greatly. I cannot sign the statement or give my name because I have broken patient confidentiality by giving some of the information I have in this account. I could be fired from my job or lose my nurse's license. So for that reason, I must remain anonymous. But I will do my best after John's death to ensure that this statement and John's statement get into the right hands. Do you know if the nurse that took the statement from uh, John Kelly, if she took, if she, there's something in there that says that put it in a safety deposit. I've got the original document. Is it handwritten or is it typed? It's typed. I know she says I typed, but I didn't know if originally she took, because she was trying to turn it over to uh, yeah. John's sister, but she didn't want it. So she gave the whole thing up. Huh? Yeah, and I mean, it's weird for somebody to send me like an original typed, typed or printed. I mean, it was the 80s, so there are computers. I mean, this is it. I mean, it feels like, you know. Which is not a copy. Xerox. That's just a copy. Okay. It's that copy. I mean. This looks like. Uh, Paper. Yeah, right. So, I mean, it, you know, that's supposedly the original. So, I mean, I would like to keep that if possible sure. because I am a collector yes. of documents, but that's the supposed original that was overnighted to me with some other material. Well, if you hold on to it for now, let's see where the other end plays right. out. Cool. And we'll maybe be asking you for the original. Now, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a couple of shows that came out, uh, Unsolved Mysteries, right. uh, I know the History Channel's done some stuff, the Discovery Channel, right. uh, and those tended to generate more leads, and we would always end up following up on those leads. We would run their fingerprints every year, nationwide, right. so if they run an alias, uh, we could find out if they committed any crimes and have been printed by some police department, same thing with Canada has a, uh, a right. mutual uh, uh, relationship with the U.S. So, we yeah, just, none just of that turned out. We just did a lead a year and a half ago in Texas, right? With the guy that looked like him. We got something. Oh, really? The lead got sent to us. We got a hold of his driver's license. Uh, it was after the, there was a History Channel show on where we aged, aged hands. Right. Did you guys do that? Yeah, yeah I noticed that, that on the internet. Yeah. And we went and sent those out to everybody. Somebody came back and said, geez, it looks just like this old guy. That is. So, so, you know, we went and followed the lead up. In Texas, I guess you have to have your fingerprints or a thumbprint on the driver's license. And we actually were able to verify that it wasn't him right. based on fingerprints. Today is March 17th. John Leroy Kelly died at 3 a.m. this date of AIDS-related pneumocytis carini pneumonia. He died quietly in his sleep. John received the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church just after 11 p.m.
So, I got some information that we can go check out a death certificate down the street on John Leroy Kelly. If he died in this area, apparently it will be on record and that's where we're going next. John was a no-co patient, so he did not attempt to resuscitate. I'm truly glad for John that his long struggle is over. May he rest in peace. I basically narrowed it down to about five hospices in the area. And from that, we're going to go back to the Hall of Records and find out if there's a death certificate. But even without a death certificate, we can get a lot of great information now. Sarah Lane of Vancouver, British Columbia called me on the phone and asked if she could come down and talk to me about her brother. I said yes, if she could agree to complete confidentiality concerning my identity. She agreed and I met her at the downtown public library. During our meeting, she brought up the Alcatraz prison escape and asked me what her brother John had told me about the Alcatraz incident. I gave her a copy of everything, and she stated that it was the same story that John had told her for years before. She stated that she had heard the same story over and over many times from John and felt she almost knew it by heart. That he and a friend helped the three convicts to escape from Alcatraz Federal Prison in San Francisco. And they then killed the three escaped convicts to keep all of a large sum of money. While we were at my Uncle Donald's, we finally decided that we would get the convicts into the back of Robert's pickup truck, drive them into the woods, and shoot them real quick and bury them. Robert picked a good spot along the highway, and we even dug a big hole before we picked them up. Robert went somewhere and got two 38 caliber pistols, which he hid in the toolbox under the driver's seat of the truck. I told her about John making his confession to the Catholic priest and that I felt it had helped John's peace of mind tremendously. And I told her that I believed John had died in peace. I had offered her these papers, including John's statement, but she said she did not want to get involved. She told me that it was true about their Uncle Donald being a driver for big time bank robbers. She said that back when he was doing this, that it worked out very well. She said that there was a family rumor that Uncle Donald had at one time been sentenced to a lot of time in Angola State Prison in Louisiana, but that he escaped after a very short time and fled to the Pacific Northwest. According to her, no one ever found Uncle Donald, and he died of an old age in Seattle. One interesting thing she said was that John had trouble getting rid of some of the money they took off the convicts because it was so old. She said that some of the bills were very large, but were still legal tender and could be spent. When she got up to leave, I again tried to give John's papers, but she refused and left. I don't really know who to give John's statements to. I have thought about mailing it to a news agency or the FBI, but I'm not really sure what to do with it. Like John, I feel the time had come for the truth about the Alcatraz prison escape to come out. I miss John at times. He probably was right about being famous if everyone knew the truth about what he did. for a death certificate um, for John Leroy Kelly. I'm obviously very curious that there's a death certificate on file because this is another piece of the puzzle that I'm trying to put together.
Typically, in Escape, a couple things happen. Um, for example, in the case of Henry Young, they made a movie real loosely based on him a few years ago. When he escaped from Walla Walla State Prison, the first thing he did was go home. Um, one thing that has led circumstantially to our belief that they probably didn't make it based on what we knew so far uh, was the fact that there were no crimes later on that were attributed to them. Uh, there was no, although family members have talked to us and claimed there were things going on, they're not going to want to um, spill the beans as it were on that. Uh, the, the typical escape would leave a trail. Is, and it's not to say that there aren't exceptions, but you know, to, to go home, to rob another bank, to commit another crime, to do something to leave a fingerprint somewhere is not at all uncommon. And it's been lacking that over the years since it's been so many years and nothing credible so far had shown up. That added to the likelihood that our opinion, or my opinion, I should say, um, that they didn't survive the bay, and it just added to that. Um, the fact that these guys never surfaced again, the fact that they never were you know, connected to any crimes again. Um, not to say that well, you know, people say, well, if they were smart, they wouldn't do those things. Well, if they were smart, they probably wouldn't have been doing what they were doing to begin with. Is right. another way to look at that. Because we, we always stuck to the theory that if they had escaped and got away, they would be committing crimes. Right. So they would eventually get caught. The only thing they knew to do was bank robbers, I mean, or career criminals. So we knew that, that they, if they did get away, they weren't in the U.S. Right. And they probably weren't in Canada because Canada has the same type of law enforcement program that we do, and they eventually would have got caught doing something right. like there. So that's why we really looked at anything internationally, and we weren't really concerned with the historical. I mean, we've had cases like this before where somebody's actually gone back, dug the bodies up, and then spread the bones someplace. I mean, you know, all we end up with was fragments of bones in there. They're never going to get up all the bones. Right. I mean, there's going to be. If there were bodies buried in there and somebody came back to, to get the bodies up, there's going to be something left in there. Gotcha. Okay? You just, it's impossible to get everything once you put something in the ground like that. What would be the method of um, forensically well, finding out? Yeah, we'll, is we'll there dental to, records or is there DNA of any kind? Or? We'll, we'll have to make that determination, uh, and we'll, whichever uh, state or local authority. We will be dealing with that. We do have records. Uh, yeah, I've got records of them. Dental records? And yep, medical and dental records uh -huh. uh, from, from the Bureau of Prisons, so uh, we can use that. But we'll make determinations. Of course, I know we're ahead of ourselves. This is, this is fluid. We're, we're going to have to play a lot of this for the year as we go. So we just met with Mike Erf and Art Roderick, the U.S. Marshals caravanning right now to meet with a local guy who knows the area. We're leaving Seattle. It's about an hour outside of Seattle. According to the statement, it's going to be about a mile and a half. On the left-hand side, there used to be a dirt road. Apparently in 1962, that dirt road was not blocked by a guardrail, but now we're going to have to walk over the guardrail. From that point, we go down the dirt road and Apparently there is going to be some big rocks that we're going to look for and some trees. On the rocks, as of 1993, there was paint to mark the rocks. And then at one point in the 80s, um, John, the guy who gave the statement, actually nailed horseshoes into trees around the area and apparently buried a box of horseshoes right over the bodies where they were buried. So underneath the horseshoes, if we find them, there may be the bodies of the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, and Frank Morris. So the, the initial thing we're looking for is the, the landmarks. So wish us luck. Over the last weekend, me and my son took John up to the spot where he says the three convicts are buried. There was still some splotches of yellow paint on the big rocks, just like John told me there would be. We took four gallons of red deck paint with us, and my son made a big circle and an X over where John says he and his friend Robert buried the three convicts in 1962.
name's Al Davis. He's an old timer. He's lived in this area for ever, for his whole life. He's at least 70 or 80 years old. Really funny, nice guy. He said though, if you, you go back even 10 years, 10, 20 years, everything's changed about this location. He said even for myself, he goes, that could describe four or five roads that aren't even there in existence anymore. So it's just, it's gonna be really hard for you to find what you're looking for. He said that we're, we're like five miles off base. He said most likely that we should go back up and turn to the right, sort of where that area that near the lake where we went. And there's actually another right turn that kind of just, I, I let him read the one paragraph about the, the directions. He said, you have better luck in that area. Um, but, you know, he just said there's just four or five places in this area that, that have changed and it's just going to be hard to find based on those semi-vague. It sounds, sounds like um, vague directions to him because there's too many options. You can no longer turn off the highway at that location. There's now a guardrail and you have to park on the roadside and walk from there. We were able to find two of the horseshoes nailed to the trees. Okay, so we have good news and bad news. The good news is we met with a tracker who knows exactly the area and exactly the turnoff where he thinks you know, the statement is pointing to. The bad news is, is that he said it's a big area. It's gonna be hard to find and that it might be snowing. So there might be snow on the ground. So anyways, we'll see. This would be the 30 foot. Yeah. This is the closest. Yes. Can you pull the truck up in here? Stand up there. We'll stand on the roof and look at this mark on the tree here. Pull yours. Uh, let me. You can't fly. Oh, okay. Hey, and does this look like red deck paint? It sure does. Holy shit! And does that look like it could be a knot or maybe a horseshoe right up there? Let's say 30 feet off the road. I mean, that's totally unnatural, is it not? I mean, it could be analyzed, of course, but I think it's worth bringing a metal detector in this area. Look at that. Well, here's the rest of it. Here's where it came off of right here. I mean, that many rounds. You know, they blasted them. They blasted them. On June 21st, we started driving towards Canada in the truck with the convict. At a few minutes past 5 p.m., Robert hit me on the leg, which was a signal we had arranged. He told them we were stopping to pee. He had made a point over the last few days 
of complaining about his weak kidneys. Less than 30 feet away, the big hole we had dug waited. And two shovels. I heard him get into the toolbox under the driver's seat for the pistol. And he handed me one of the pistols down by his side. We walked to the back of the truck. Robert opened the truck's tailgate. Frank Morris must have seen the pistol in Robert's hand because I heard Morris say, you sons of bitches, but in almost the same instant, we were both shooting into the back of the truck. I'd never been able to forget the way they jumped around and the sound the bullets made when they hit their bodies. It was the worst thing that I did in my life. Robert reloaded his pistol and I pulled the convicts out by their feet. John Anglin was the last one I pulled out, and he was alive and talking. Even though he had been hit several times and had to be hurting very badly, he begged not to die. But Robert shot him three or four more times. dumped them into the big hole we had dug. One at a time, we threw our pistols into the hole along with the bloody canvas they had been lying on in the back of the truck. We covered them up and spread a bag of grass seed all over the dug up ground. Do it this close? Of course, this is more well, secluded than down there with the houses. Yeah, and, and then in the 60s, there's probably not as much traffic. I mean, they put all the horses on one tree? No, there, there are four, four in a circle, sort of a circle. And then when they came back in the 90s, there were only two left. We 
looking up at a tree, and if you look closely, it looks like potentially where a horseshoe could have been at one point. Either the tree could have grown around it, or the tree could have pushed it out of its bark. Yeah, it could go around. This is a spot here we're going to have to... Yeah. They, they, they buried a box of horseshoes. He came back in the 80s and buried a box of horseshoes so that they could find the spot again. Okay. This is one potential site that's about 30 feet off the road, off the 90. There's a guardrail over there. There's also evidence that it could be a horseshoe up on a tree about 14 feet high. We'll see. It's not far. I think it's got potential like crazy in those paint chips in that little place that could have been a horseshoe at one time. I don't know. So we're calling it a day. It's getting dark. We found one spot that had a lot of potential with a couple markings and a horseshoe shaped indentation in a tree. So we're going to come back tomorrow at the spot and see what else we can find out. Yesterday, we were a little discouraged when we went to the location because the rocks weren't quite as big as we expected. And there were a few things about the statement that, um, that Mike Earp had pointed out that troubled him in some manner. I mean, most of the things about the statement turned out to be, look like they're totally correct and accurate. But some of the questions he posed, I, I gave it a little thought over the last 12 hours, and this is my idea of the answers, maybe. One of the things that he said was um, that it was very unlikely that they would trust somebody with forty or fifty thousand dollars. This person, Uncle Donald, because in the '60s that was a ton of money. Now I thought about that, and number one, Frank Morris, he was friends with this Uncle Donald, and Uncle Donald was 78 years old at the time. So I just don't see that some 78-year-old guy would <clears throat> necessarily run off with the money from a friend of his at that age. The other part about it's being a large, large amount of money, you know, for sort of like two-bit thieves to put together. When you think about it, there were supposed to be five people, five convicts escaping at Alcatraz. So, Five people, let's say forty or fifty thousand dollars, their family, some of the money that they they got in bank robberies, that's only about ten thousand dollars a piece, approximately ten, twelve thousand dollars. So to start a new life in Canada, which was obviously the idea according to this statement, ten, twelve thousand dollars a piece, split by five men, seems like a reasonable amount of money to put together, especially if you've got a loved one in jail. Back to the location. So we went to the location yesterday, and so, you know, in, in our mind's eye, we sort of maybe thought these rocks were gonna be bigger. Um, we, did, we did find some really interesting evidence. We found a really cool looking horseshoe shaped indentation in a tree. We also found some paint scraps in yellow and red, which is, again, we didn't find exactly paint on the rocks. But we found some evidence that you know, is circumstantial and enough to follow up on. So today we're going to go back, and I'm not sure what else we'll, we'll ask the um, US Marshals what else they're going to do, but we, we've identified a really highly potential site. Okay, we, we're back at this spot and I just found a few interesting things. 
Okay, originally they said that they nailed, or he nailed four horseshoes into a tree. Just bear with me. Look at that nail. One. See the nail? Come over here. Two. looking for horseshoes now you know when she came back apparently there were only two left but now there are no horseshoes but look there there are one two three over there and four nails and this is the area that I said looks like somebody maybe came back at some point just point the camera right down there I'm not saying this is where the hole was dug but maybe this is where he came back and dug this little ground up to bury the horseshoes it's not like this area looks to me a little unnatural to the rest. It looks like something was dug out and it's all uneven here. This feels like if anywhere could be the spot, you know, this has got a lot of potential. There are four nails in somewhat of a circle in this spot and it's act exactly what we're looking for. Now come over here and look at these rocks. Yellow. I'm hoping that we'll come back and survey this whole area because this ground, this area, and those markings look good to me. You know George Clooney's gonna play you in the movie version, right? Doing well. Very good. Some research on it now to find out what the deal is. You know, we'll have to get the GPS coordinates that particular location we'll probably do that today um, but i know the name of the individual you got this statement from uh if we could just do a back we can run a background on it right now we can call our pictures find out if he's connected to what his mother's name is where she's right from where he's been right he's got to be the son of it, 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 i mean he's got to yeah, he's real <coughs> paranoid about his identity. Right. You know, we're, we're at that point. I mean, we don't even know if she's alive. Of course. Right. Right. And if you're telling me this guy sounds like he's in his fifties, and this is his mother, and she's got to be at least in her seventies or eighties. Right. You know. Right. I got you. So. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're gonna but have they gave the statements. Let's, let's be honest about it. Yeah. They are the ones providing statements yeah. in reference. Right, right, right. To this guy confessing to homicides and whatnot. Yeah. Mm. Well, those law enforcement uh, officials that could be investigating that, yeah, their, their name's going to have to be known. They're going to be questioned. They're going to be interviewed. They're going to be possibly compelled to testify. I mean, there is a possibility. the accuracy of these statements. Right. There's no doubt. I want to mislead you yeah. on that. That is. I mean, right. as far as we're concerned, the public's not going to get any information. No, we're not going to release anything. I mean, we don't. But to law enforcement, yeah. Right. It's my... Who was this man, John Leroy Kelly? A phantom, a charlatan, a phony? Or was he telling the truth? 
Did he and his partner take part in one of the most well-planned and coordinated escapes in history? An escape that could only have been successful with help from inside and outside the walls of the rock. What is irrefutable is that the three men made it out of their cells and into the water that night. It is only speculated that they drowned at sea. Was the culmination of their complex plan merely to swim across the bay, risking hypothermia and drowning, only to come ashore in bustling downtown San Francisco? Or did they have something more sophisticated in mind? For now, their fate still remains a mystery. Or does it? One rocky island, 29 long years, 14 incredible breakouts. It didn't take a smart man, it took a brave man. From the most desperate and the most bizarre to the fatal escape of gangster Doc Barker. On the rock, pitch battle raged from the first alarm. We are going to have blood for blood. You shot ours, we're going to shoot you. From the bloody Battle of Alcatraz to the Great Escape. Well, they made it. They made it. Back, that's all I heard. These are the stories of 34 men, their hunger for freedom, and their amazing escapes from Alcatraz. And here's America's Devil's Island. Grim and inaccessible. The federal penitentiary on Alcatraz Island. Helcatraz, America's Devil's Island, a prison created for the worst of the worst, the toughest of the tough, for men like Al Capone, Machine Gun Kelly, and Creepy Carpus. A maximum security prison, the government said, was escape-proof, designed to confine, control, and intimidate. But over three decades, from 1934 to 1963, despite huge risks, overwhelming odds, and sometimes certain death, prisoners continued to break out. There's nothing in prison. Prison is a uh, total deprivation of everything that's good. A man wants freedom. You get locked in your bedroom, you want to get out. He's, he's an animal, but he still wants freedom. You know, it's in the human psyche to want to escape. Freedom. It's just in our genes. Who were these men who had the chance to challenge the rock? Most were career bank robbers, murderers and kidnappers, men who had resisted authority, ignored risks and embraced violence. They were men like convicted murderer Lucky Julik. He killed a federal marshal. They knew I had killed and they knew that I would kill again while I was in prison. Men like Jim Quillen, a kidnapper, among the youngest criminals ever sent to Alcatraz. Terrible temper, which got me in lots and lots of trouble. And bank robber John Decker. 
I got to Alcatraz in November 1953 for trying to escape from Leavenworth and not being a good boy. They were men who failed to conform in other prisons and graduated to the pinnacle of penitentiaries, Alcatraz. Fully a third of them arrived because of previous escape attempts, and more than half of them were considered escape risks. With their backgrounds, tempted by the proximity of San Francisco and tormented by long sentences and rigid confinement, many prisoners were consumed with thoughts of escape. That was the greatest fantasy in the world to keep from going crazy. Constantly, there was always at least 50 or 80 inmates out of the 200 who were uh, scheming uh, ways and avenues of uh, escaping from Alcatraz. But the obstacles to escape were many. First, there was the facility itself, beginning with the stark cell house where the prisoners lived, one to a cell, its walls made of thick, impenetrable concrete, and its bars supposedly impossible to cut or even bend. And outside the cell house, fences everywhere, barbed wire, and dangerous rocky cliffs. Then there were the guards, about 60 of them supervising an average of 260 prisoners. More than one guard for every five prisoners. They constantly counted and checked prisoners, and in the early 30s enforced complete silence. They frequently carried weapons, and often were stationed in protective cages, like the cell house's gun gallery and the island's guard towers. Well, the first obstacle is hypothermia. But the biggest challenge of all was a mile and a quarter of icy water and the deadly currents that surrounded the island. The average temperature was 55 degrees, and the tides can be so strong that foolish swimmers were sometimes swept right through the Golden Gate and lost forever in the Pacific Ocean. For an inexperienced swimmer, like an escaping prisoner, San Francisco Bay was a disaster waiting to happen. They don't know how strong the tide is. They, they supposedly don't know which way the tide is going, whether it's ebbing uh, going out or flooding coming in. Um, they, uh, their, their distance over water is very deceptive. Uh, it looks maybe, uh, the land looks closer than it really is. They start swimming. Um, they get tired. They get cold. Then you just lose it. You start to thrash around. After a while, the body, the body becomes perpendicular and it goes down like a lead weight. <laughs> and if that wasn't frightening enough, there was another water hazard. But this one was completely imaginary. Though there's never been a documented shark attack within San Francisco Bay, many prisoners and even some guards believed out there were man-eaters. From the day one you came here, they always had the word spread between the prisoners and the officers that there were sharks in the water around Alcatraz. The old joke is that they used to take the sharks, the sharks, they used to catch the sharks, cut off the fins on one side, and throw them back so that they would swim around the island. <laughs> we believed it. I believed it. Everyone believed it. And this was the single most psychological uh, weapon that the prison authorities had. Sharks were really not the problem. But guys from Kansas City or from Oklahoma City or from New York, they didn't know this. Well, we encouraged the belief that there were sharks out there in the bay, and indeed there were, but they weren't man-eaters. Every prisoner planning an escape in the future would have to overcome each of these obstacles. Over the years, they would learn from each attempt, get closer, and some believe even succeed. But in the beginning, and occasionally throughout the prison's history, attempts were made that were simply acts of pure desperation. Bowers was a suicide. He served here during the, the rough years, the silent years, and it got to him, basically. In 1936, two years after the opening of Alcatraz, a 40-year-old post office robber of limited intelligence named Joseph Bowers made Alcatraz's first escape attempt. While under guard supervision outside the cell house, he ran for it. Despite warnings, he continued to climb a barbed wire top security fence. He was easily targeted. A rifle shot hit him in the chest and killed him. They loved to kill a man that was trying to escape. His attempt was a lesson to other prisoners. Real escapes would take real planning. They would also see here the first in a series of examples of the dangers of armed guards and what many convicts felt was an unwritten policy of shoot to kill. 
The reason for that is what better message to the other prisoners than the man that just got shot trying to escape. And they, uh, 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 they actually believed themselves, the guards, that this was an escape-proof prison. And they didn't want nothing to tarnish that record. Coming up, the Bay claims its first victims. Plus, gangster Doc Barker leads Alcatraz's first nighttime escape. In 1937, a year and a half after Alcatraz's first fatal escape attempt, 25-year-old kidnapper Theodore Cole and 31-year-old bank robber Ralph Rowe made Alcatraz's first planned breakout. It began in one of the buildings that was later torn down, known as the Old Laundry. In this building, along with the Model Industries building and the future New Industries building, convicts who demonstrated good behavior were given the privilege of working during weekdays. Because there were tools here to break through bars and windows, and because it was near the water, it was a logical location for a breakout. Over weeks, Cole and Rowe had used a stolen hacksaw blade to cut a bar covering a window. To make sure guards didn't see the seam, they filled the crack with shoe polish. On the afternoon of their escape, they pushed out the bars, smashed the window, and ran for the water. With them, it's rumored they had five-gallon cans to help them float. What happened next, no one knows for sure. Some say they saw them swim for a few dozen yards, lose control of their floats, and then sink. Cole and Rowe were never seen again. Most, including Alcatraz's warden Johnston, believed the bay had taken its first victims. Serving terms tantamount to life imprisonment, it is my belief they decided to take a desperate chance and that they had no outside aid. I believe they drowned and that their bodies were swept toward the Golden Gate by the strong ebb tide. Cole and Rowe were followed five months later in 1938 by three dangerous bank robbers, Thomas Limerick, Rufus Franklin, and James Lucas. They also broke out from the Model Industries building. On the afternoon of May 23rd, they hit and killed a guard with a hammer. They fled to the roof, hoping to surprise the tower guard, take his weapon, and fight their way out. But Officer Harold P. Stites was not surprised. He shot down Limerick and Franklin and Lucas soon surrendered. Officer Stites had survived this escape attempt. Eight years later, it would be a different story. Arthur Doc Barker was the first celebrity convict to attempt an escape from Alcatraz. He was the son of gangster Ma Barker, the leader of the legendary Barker Gang. In 1939, he was serving a life sentence for bank robbing and kidnapping. Doc Barker was about five foot three. He was a morphine addict. He had an IQ, unfortunately, of about 81. We're not talking a, a, a giant intellectually here. By sawing through their cell bars and using a bar spreader on a cell house window, Doc Barker and his kidnapper and bank robber associates, Dale Stamphill, Rufus Roy McCain, Henry Young, and William Martin, were able to stage Alcatraz's first nighttime breakout and the largest breakout to date. They headed for the shore where the gang split up, Barker, Stamphill, and Martin going their own way, while McCain and Young stripped their clothes, tore them up, and began tying together wood scraps and driftwood for a makeshift raft. Unfortunately for Barker and his gang, one of the guard's many cell house body counts revealed their absence. McCain and Young soon surrendered, followed by a badly bruised Martin. But Stamp Hill and Doc Barker ran for it. Stamp Hill was shot in the leg. He lived. Barker was hit in the head, soon to die. To prisoners on the island, this escape reinforced their belief in the guards' shoot-to-kill policy. It also reminded them of another key factor to any escape. With constant counts and bed checks, prisoners needed to create decoys, such as false heads or masks. Doc Barker escape attempt stands out because it was a cell house escape attempt. Uh, and uh, the thing that they learned from that escape attempt is that you needed a long lead time. And how did you get it? You know, you, Doc Barker, they made a mistake. They did not leave masks in their cells. Therefore, guards on their rounds discovered that they were gone, 
within a half an hour. When you look back, you know, that was what you got from that escape. We need to have masks. But the story didn't end here. Following the escape, Young and McCain spent a year in solitary confinement. They then returned to normal prison life and took up work in the prison tailor shop. There, late in 1940, while at work, Young fatally stabbed McCain. Here's one explanation for the murder, reported by former inmate and gangster Creepy Carpus. McCain had ne neglected to mention until he got to the beach that he couldn't swim. And, you know, they had to come back and build him a boat to help him get off the island. It was this one for all, all for one thing, right? And uh, Young focused on McCain as the reason why the escape failed and why Doc Barker was killed. And so he killed him. Coming up, the first of only two known Alcatraz convicts to escape to land and his masquerade that even the guards were rooting for. Nineteen forty one was marked by two badly bungled escape attempts. John Bayless, an habitual criminal serving twenty five years for bank robbery, made a run for it while working outdoors on garbage detail. He made it to the bay, but the cold and the current turned him back. He was found shivering and defeated at the water's edge. Also in 1941, while working in the replacement for the Model Industries building, called the New Industries building, brothers-in-law and crime partners Joe Kretzer and Arnold Kyle, along with Floyd Barkdahl and Sam Shockley, captured guards and attempted to break through a barred window. Unfortunately, they couldn't get through the barred window. They soon surrendered to one of their captives, a talkative officer, Paul J. Madigan, who encouraged them to recognize the error of their ways. Madigan never lost his cool. He was just one of these uh, good-natured Irishmen that uh, uh, people didn't make or take offense when he made a remark about the, <laughs> the futility of what they were doing. In this case, they, uh, they listened to what the captain had to say and surrendered. Two years later, in 1943, there were two breakouts related to another of Alcatraz's celebrity gangsters, former number one public enemy and henchman for Bonnie and Clyde, Floyd Hamilton. One involved a bank robber associate of his named Ted Walters. Walters also attempted an escape from the New Industries building. He too was recaptured at the water's edge, shivering and cold, unable to decide whether or not to swim for it. The other escape attempt involved Floyd Hamilton himself. It would lead to the prison's first real security embarrassment. Hamilton was accompanied by blackmailer and car thief Harold Brest, kidnapper Fred Hunter, and 24-year-old bank robber James Borman. They too escaped from the New Industries building, running nearly naked to the water. They were soon spotted by a guard who opened fire. Brest and Borman were hit. Borman soon died, and Hunter soon surrendered. However, Floyd Hamilton's body was not recovered, and everyone, including Alcatraz's warden Johnston, assumed he was dead. We're positive that Hamilton is dead. He was shot, and we saw him go under. But Floyd Hamilton was not dead. He had only successfully feigned death by holding his breath and ducking the bullets. Hamilton then swam to one of the island's nearby caves, where he hid for two days before crawling back up to the prison. The next night, he can't stand it anymore because he's so chilled from the cold and because there are crabs in there that are nibbling away at his, well, I guess nibbling is, is, is too mild a term, biting away at him, and so he felt that survival meant getting back up on the island and getting into the prison. A proud warden, Johnston, was stunned to hear that Hamilton was still alive. He was speechless. I never, <laughs> I never heard a comment from the warden as to his, his error in pronouncing this man deceased. But the public and the island's prisoners were not speechless. They questioned the need for the tower officer to open fire on these escapees who were so easily surrounded and far from freedom. And I think uh, 
if he had wanted to hit them. He could have killed all four of them. I think that uh, the inmate that was hit, Borman, swam into that bullet. He blew his brains out, took the top of his head off. That's not a bad shot. I know that Jim Quillen feels very, very much upset, thinks it was cold-blooded murder. But there was an unwritten policy in this institution. Get in the water and we're going to kill you if we can. The summer of 1945 saw one of the cleverest escapes in the history of Alcatraz. Its mastermind, 50-year-old post office robber John Giles, was one of only two documented prisoners to break out and get to land. He worked on the Alcatraz docks, loading and unloading military laundry that was washed on Alcatraz. Over the years, he assembled the pieces of a complete sergeant's uniform. On July 31st, he put the uniform on under his prison clothes. When the guards weren't looking, he took off his convict garb and wearing the sergeant's uniform, slipped on board a military launch called the General Coxie that was leaving the island. Unfortunately for Giles, a dock headcount on the island revealed his absence. A swift Alcatraz boat was able to catch up to the military launch before its next port, which was nearby Angel Island and not San Francisco as Giles had hoped. There, Giles was met by an amused Alcatraz guard. Apparently, Giles did not see us, either approaching the island, passing the coxie or whatever, because uh, when he came marching off the coxie on the dock at Angel Island, we were there with the handcuffs, and <laughs> he just took one disgusted look at us and said, I thought that GD tub was heading for San Francisco, as if that would have made any difference. So we put the handcuffs on him and put him in the launch and no hard feeling, you know, we took him back to Alcatraz. It was the only escape attempt that captain of the guards, Phil Bergen, off the record, almost wished had succeeded. No, I couldn't do that professionally. It was a good thing for morale. And I think they should have given Giles a little reward instead of five years. He'd put in a lot of time, he was getting old. Wouldn't have been any, uh, any particular threat to society if he was on the street. Coming up, the bloody battle of Alcatraz and the controversy that's still alive today. Why did they, for the entire night and part of the next day, continue to bombard us in here? Though there were only 14 documented escape attempts on Alcatraz, there were countless escape plans and tries that either fizzled out or were discovered by the guards. Okay, this is a kitchen basement. Convicted kidnapper Jim Quillen remembers his escape plan and the danger of exploring a route that would get him out of the cell house through a scalding steam tunnel. They were walking and looking for a way to escape. We recognized, looked, saw this uh, lid in here and wondered what was in here. And we got the lock picked and found out that there was a passageway under here down all the way to what we thought went clear to the powerhouse. It was too narrow and too small for two people to turn around in. So we have to have one person back in, one person crawl in. You would sweat. The sweat would hit those pipes and it was just sizzle. And if you broke one of the pipes, you were going to be instantly cooked because that was live hot steam. Ultimately, an inmate informed on Jim Quillen. As punishment for his escape plan, he was sent to the prison's most restricted tier of cells, known as D-block, or isolation. And it's here where Jim Quillen became part of one of the most famous escape attempts in the history of the rock, the Battle of Alcatraz. On the rock, pitch battle raged from the first alarm. The Battle of Alcatraz lasted almost two days, beginning midday, Thursday, May 2nd, 1946. It attracted worldwide attention. By its end, Saturday morning, two officers and three prisoners would be dead, including its mastermind, a Kentucky bank robber named Bernard Coy, and his associates, killer and bank robber Joseph Kretzer, and veteran bank robber Marvin Hubbard. It began with the daring plan of Bernard Coy. After eight years of incarceration, 
he had noticed a weak spot in the bars protecting one of the two cell house guard gun galleries. While polishing the floors, he and Hubbard attacked the cell house officer, badly wounding him. Coy, who had been dieting so he could fit through the narrow bars, then stripped off his clothes to become even slimmer and scaled the gun gallery bars to the weak spot. Using a spreader, he was able to slip through the bars, sneak through the gallery, overpower the gun gallery guard, and capture a rifle and pistol. It was the first and last time a prisoner would get guns. So that if you think about it, we're going to have hostages, we're going to have weapons, no inmates in any other break at Alcatraz ever had weapons. Uh, that the idea, if, you, if you're desperate and saying uh, this is better than spending the rest of my life in prison for those who had come to that conclusion, uh, then you've got something going for you. Next, Coy, Kretzer, and Hubbard hope to use the keys stored in the gun gallery to get out of the cell house. But here their plan disintegrated when a guard prior to the breakout, ignoring standard procedure for his own convenience, slipped the keys into his pocket. The prisoners would never get the cell house door open. Over the next few hours, they would encourage other prisoners to join their breakout. They would take guards as hostages. And in anger and frustration, Joe Kretzer would fire on those hostages. The response to their breakout was brutal. Well, this old cell brings back a lot of memories. This is where I spent the 1946 uh, uprising. 36 hours of torture, torment, and hell. Four of us were in this cell, and the break had occurred. The guns had been secured from the gun gallery. During the Four heat of the breakout, Jim Quillen was one of the inmates the given the chance to join in. He momentarily left his cell, but returned hours. within minutes, fearing the worst. The three other inmates, Clarence Carnes, Myron Thompson, and veteran of the 1941 escape, Sam Shockley, also returned to their cells. All of them faced hours of bombardment from guards. The Army, Navy, Coast Guard, and two assault platoons of Marines massed around the cell house to put down the escape. Jim Quillen's only protection was three mattresses pressed against his cell bars. Finally, a grenade came through, exploded in the cell next to us, or close to it, broke the toilet, the water ran down the tier, was absorbed by the mattresses, which really saved our lives because it couldn't burn. They stopped the hot fragments. They stopped the bullets. So we laid in the water here for 36 hours. This ended up in my back, and there were two smaller pieces that had apparently disappeared. These were extracted from my back by the prison doctor. However, the prisoners weren't the only ones in jeopardy. During the breakout, volunteer guards were sent into the cell house under the same heavy fire that Jim Quillen experienced. Guard Al Bloomquist says that in the confusion, he was hit by friendly fire from outside. The sad thing about this was the fact that they had posted officers down below D block in the hillside down there, and they gave them orders to shoot, to kill, if we saw any movement by any windows. And then they neglected to tell them, don't shoot. We're sending officers into D block. Just unbelievable lapse of memory and carelessness. His injuries were minor, but the other guard with him, Harold Stites, the same Harold Stites who had put down the Limerick, Franklin, and Lucas escape, was less fortunate. While changing positions, he was mortally wounded. And after maybe an hour, maybe two hours, I don't remember, he said, uh, I'm getting sick and tired of sitting here. So I'm going I'm to walk around into the cell house. I said, Stites, you're nuts. You go by that window, you're, 
you, you're not allowed to get what I, I didn't get. I said, you're probably going to get killed. I said, don't go by that window. Well, he said, I, I'll take a chance. He said, I, I can't sit here forever. I want to go and sell house, see what's going on. Well, I, it's up to you. I wouldn't do it if I were you. I wouldn't move. So he got up. He walked past that same window. He got drilled dead center. He went head first down those steel steps in D block and landed on his head down there. He was dead. He was dead. We just got him dead center. One of our own officers, killed by friendly fire. I was right up behind that thing there. Right. And I was right down there. Today, the controversy theater. over the Battle of Alcatraz continues. I will say this. Ultimately, the bodies of Coy, Kretzer, and Hubbard, the three original escapees, were found in C Block, killed by grenade fire. With D Block sealed off from the rest of the cell house, was the bombardment of these non resisting inmates necessary? At the opposite end of the spectrum are the views of former captain of the guards, <laughs> Philip Bergen, and former convict, Jim Quillen. The thing that angers me, and it still angers me to this day, is once that door was locked, why did they for the entire night and part of the next day continue to bombard us in here with rifle grenades, hand grenades, machine gun fire, rifles, whatever they could fire down the tiers, when the door was locked and the rifle couldn't go anywhere? My contention is that uh... When, uh, when I led the assault on this uh, unit along about 6.30 p.m. that evening, we were met by heavy gunfire. In view of the fact, the way Joe shot those guards, and I can understand the anger of the crew that came in and found them, um, I think D-Block was going to be a matter of revenge. We are going to have blood for blood. You shot ours, we're going to shoot you. I don't think it should have been done, but uh, I'm not the commanding general. I'm, no, I, agree. I understand I'm, that. Uh, I, I was in the position of being the forward observer. I agree with you. I wouldn't argue that one second. And if the rifle was in here, Coy, whoever had it, would have got you. Well, I'd have got him. Well, <laughs> that again, that... I was a better shot than Coy. <laughs> if I'd have lined my sights on him, he'd have been dead. But uh, <laughs> Coy was a braggart. And, Coy uh, had a lot of guts. He didn't have much sense. He had the guts. Well, we won't sense. argue that. Anybody who come up in that gun gallery with, with absolutely nothing after a guy with a odd 6 and a forty five didn't have much good sense. I agree with you. But he had guts. <laughs> well, there's a people put a lot of stock in guts, but guts without brains is uh, pretty useless. Well, he broke down a system that you were so intent that you epitomized to the world. This is escape proof. Nobody can do it. But this ridge runner from Kentucky, he went in there. He took the rifle away from one of your guards. Don't tell me he didn't have something upstairs. Sure, Jim Quillen what, what and Phil Bergen will probably spend the remaining years of their lives debating the chaos that was the Battle of Alcatraz. Four, five, six, seven, eight, you know. There were no winners in the battle, but there was a moment of remarkable courage from Robert Stroud, the famed birdman of Alcatraz. Today, he's remembered as a friendly bird lover. However, in real life, he never kept birds on Alcatraz. That came from his years at Leavenworth Prison. And contrary to popular belief, few inmates or guards found him likable or admirable. But in this case, he was a hero. So in 1946, you had guards down the hill shooting through these windows. And the, uh, the grenades and the launchers were coming down and hitting on the ground. And the shrapnel was going in the cells here. And these men were totally unprotected because their solid steel doors were open. And the only man who seemed to care about that was Robert Stroud, the bird man of Alcatraz. And he had moved down the tier. He lived up in cell 42, and he had moved down the tier 
as well as everybody else, because they were shooting in this corner. And Stroud came out of his cell, and he climbed down the tiers to the floor while the firing was going on. And he walked up to each cell, and he closed the solid steel doors, thereby protecting the men in all of the cells. And he was 56 years old when he did this. Coming up, Alcatraz's most bizarre escape, plus the great escape. Could they have made it? They used a weapon, if you will, that had probably never been used before on Alcatraz. They used their own human intellect. Following the Battle of Alcatraz, there were 16 years of relative tranquility on the rock. From the summer of 1946 to the spring of 1962, there were only two minor escape attempts. The first involved 41-year-old bank robber and murderer Floyd Wilson. In 1956, while working on the dock, Wilson slipped away. Twelve hours later, he was discovered looking for driftwood to make a raft. He was so desperate that he went along with a guy to put rocks in his pocket. The other attempt involved former public enemy number one and Memphis bank robber Clyde Johnson and St. Louis stick-up artist Aaron Burgett. In 1958, while on garbage detail, they jumped and tied up a guard. Johnson was recovered within an hour, but Burgett was not. It seems he came up with some unique escape aids. He created makeshift fins out of wood scraps. He also carried some rocks with him. Some say he thought this would help him stay more vertical in the water. Burgett washed up 13 days later, horizontal and dead. I told him, I said, Clyde, for God's sake, don't put no rocks in your pocket. I said, because it'll take you to the bottom like a, like a stone. And he told me uh, when he got out, finally got out of the hole, he said, that's what happened to the other guy. He went straight to the bottom like a stone. He said, Aaron went down, and he didn't come up. And he still didn't come up. And Clyde's waiting and waiting and waiting. He still didn't come up. And all the weeds got to him. That's the way Clyde put it. But it was flippers, not no rocks. They used a weapon, if you will, that had probably never been used before on Alcatraz. They used their own human intellect. Four years later, in 1962, Alcatraz experienced the greatest escape of all, a painstaking ingenious plan that would be popularized in movies, permanently mar the island's escape-proof image, and ultimately contribute to its demise. Legend has it that the mastermind of the escape was 35-year-old bank robber Frank Lee Morris. Frank was quiet. He was intelligent. He was very determined to get out. He uh, was considered a genius among the population here and an intellectual, and basically what that meant was that he played chess and he read books. He was quiet. He could keep his, he could keep his nose clean. Morris was joined in this escape by two brothers, John and Clarence Anglin. The Anglins were fish. But, you know, fish, a fish is a guy who just came to the prison. You know, he's, he's the new kid on the block. He can't quite be trusted. But for, for the Anglins, it was sort of a lifelong art form. The impression that I get from everything I've read about them is they were kind of bumbling. Other players in the escape were 17-year Alcatraz veteran and Choctaw Indian Clarence Carnes, the manipulative, shrewd, and untrusted Alan West, and this man, former bank robber Tom Kent, who says Alan West was the man who first came up with the plan. We all heard it together from him. Uh, to, we were working one day in February in the library, Frank Morris, myself, Tom Kent, and Joseph Carnes, and uh, outside the library, Alan West was carrying a paint can. He was painting the cells. He came over to the library screen, and he called us all over to the screen in the library, and he said, I just found a way out. We said, what are you talking about, way out? He said, I found an escape route on top of B block. He said, I think it can be made. There's a vent up there. I think it can be opened, and we get out through the back of the cells and put dummies in the bed some night. Clarence Carnes didn't like the plan and Tom Kent soon backed out because he couldn't swim. 
Morris and the Anglins, however, were interested. But first, Morris wanted to see the vent for himself. So Frank Morris moved up here to 356. This was called B356. He took this cell so that we could, he could observe the actual vent that was later to be used to escape from the prison. We wanted someone <coughs> besides Alan West who could verify that the escape was actually feasible. Satisfied that the scheme could work, Morris, Alan West, and the Anglin brothers went to work. With homemade tools, among them a drill created from a scavenged vacuum cleaner motor, they cut through the back of their cells. They used ring binder jackets to make fake covers. And with plaster, concrete, paint, and human hair, made dummy heads as decoys. With these in place, at night they could climb up the utility corridor behind their cells to the top of the cell house. There they worked to release the vent, and with stolen raincoat material, made a raft and life preservers. Their preparations took months, and none of the guards ever saw a thing. West was maintenance. Uh, he was uh, instructed to go to the top of the cell block uh, and clean up there. And uh, he'd clean, you know, and sweep off the dust, and it would fall down onto the flats, and then it would fall into people's cells. And he could get prisoners to go to the guards and say, hey, I don't like this. I got dust all over. And they supplied him with 50 or more blankets, and he lined the... Uh, the bars with them and this way here the prisons could not be seen they had a light up here so they could work in the dark the light was blocked by the blankets the guards also never heard a thing these inmates were asked at the music hour when they were practicing in the afternoon to make a great deal of noise and they did and while this noise was going on you got John and Clarence back here drilling away and later on Alan Clayton West and Frank Morris drilled away as well um, and the musicians helped cover it. So on the night of the escape, June 11, 1962, after months of preparation, Frank Morris, Clarence and John Anglin, and Alan West began their escape. But almost immediately, Alan West had a problem. He was an idiot. He, he, he didn't make the hole big enough. And he worked for an hour to break, it, break some more rock loose so they could get out of the hole. It took him in 50 minutes. I asked him, how long did you do it? He said, I, he said, because we were mad that they left without him. And I said, Alan, how long did you work? He said, I worked for 50 minutes. And I got back up on the roof. He said they were gone. But for Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers, the escape appears to have gone flawlessly. They went through the roof then, across the cell house, scaled down the wall, got to the water, inflated their raft, entered the bay, and were never seen again. And did they make it? Most believe not. They mainly cite the fact that after all these years, someone would have come forward or left a message. Who could resist telling such a great secret? Clarence couldn't eat a tuna fish sandwich without telling everybody at the table about it. Uh, they were loudmouth, boastful, bragging. The other side, however, says there was no need to comment. Morris and the Anglin brothers got another chance at life and never looked back. And does Tom Kent think they made it? Oh, yes. There's no way they couldn't. They, had, they never swam. They had raft and they had the oars. And there was only a short way to go across here to Angel Island. And they, the best proof in the world that they, that they made it, for, to me, is they never found the raft and they, which they were supposed to destroy and they never found the three people. I think they may have done. Yes, I think when you add it all up, when you put everything together, and f what they did, how they did it, when it was done, it was good enough, I think, that they may easily have survived. Coming up, what may be the greatest escape of all? John Paul Scott, the man who floated to freedom. The old-time prison officers would say he just had rabbit in him. Well, if you saw John Paul Scott, you would think that this was Casper Milk Toast. This was the, 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 the meekest looking, quiet, uh, small man, uh, a man who never uh, assaulted uh, staff members, never threatened staff members, uh, but someone whose mentality was that even though he had a very long sentence, he wasn't depressed uh, about it because he just wouldn't be here that long. 
The last escape from Alcatraz was led in December of 1962 by bank robber John Paul Scott, accompanied by another bank robber, Daryl Parker. They used, among other things, string and an abrasive powder to cut through the basement kitchen bars. They ran undetected to the water's edge. There, they inflated surgical gloves for insulation and as a flotation. Parker didn't really know how to swim and soon gave up, but Scott caught a swift tide and headed towards the Golden Gate Bridge. He was amazed that, uh, that it was all happening, that it had worked so well. Uh, when you understand the history of escapes from Alcatraz in the 30 years or 29 years before he made it, nobody else had been able to, uh, to do that. But this is a very determined man. But soon Scott became worried that he was moving too fast, that he might be swept out to sea. He had hoped to land on a sandy beach rumored to be near Fort Point at the southern base of the Golden Gate Bridge. But when he couldn't see it, he headed for some nearby barnacle-covered rocks. There, the rocks and waves battered him so badly that when his exhausted body was found, people thought he had jumped off the bridge. Sadly for Scott, he was just a few dozen yards away from that beach and a soft landing. A few years ago, uh, I went to the other side of Fort Point with a park ranger. There is, in fact, the sandy beach there. I took a picture of it. And when I went back to the prison where Scott was then serving uh, a federal sentence, I showed the pictures of that beach to him. And uh, if you listen to the tape of that interview, you, all you hear him saying is, oh, my God, oh, my God, there it was. And then you hear me saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have showed it to you. Uh, because uh, it really was kind of painful for him to have seen how close that sandy beach was. He could have made it. Four months later, the penitentiary on Alcatraz Island closed. And with it went the ultimate test for the ultimate prisoners. Over nearly three decades, they challenged it, planned escapes, and dreamed of freedom. They tried everything, from the brilliant to the comical, from the brutal to the bizarre. But none are known to have succeeded. It's likely that every attempt ultimately failed. But from the point of view of some prisoners, there is a respect for those who took on the impossible. For those who did more than talk, more than dream. For the individual men who actually risked and sometimes lost their lives in their escapes from Alcatraz. If you at least tried, you would never ever have to say to yourself, I wonder if I could have ever made it this way or that way, or the, or the way I was planning to make it. At least you could say, well, you know, I, at least I tried. I tried, you know. Alcatraz Penitentiary, The Rock. There is no American prison more infamous and no group of inmates more notorious. When a murderous crime wave swept across the nation, this prison was opened to house the most incorrigible, fearsome names like Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly. The plan was to put all the bad apples in one basket and nail the lid shut. Remove these hardcore and high-profile convicts from the rest of the prison system, throw them in one escape-proof pen, then crush their will and break their spirit. Physical brutality was not the rule here. Mental brutality was the rule here. Uh, and that's what it was meant to do, was to break you mentally. This wasn't a prison of rehabilitation. This was a prison of punishment, strictly punishment. We weren't sent here for our crimes that we committed out in that free world. Technically, we were sent here for crimes that we committed in other penitentiaries. Guys they could not break, strong-willed men, that's what came to Alcatraz. The 
problem was that the prison itself and the way it was run with punishment in mind made guys psychotic. So you lose the ability to sit down and reason things out. You had to do whatever you have to do to survive. If that means you and I have a beef, then I'm out to hurt you as bad as I can hurt you so I don't have to do it again. When I come to this prison, you yourself could be the biggest notorious killer there ever was, but I could care less. You know why? I can kill you just as easy as you can kill me. That was my attitude. You didn't intimidate nobody on this island. Uh, if a man threatened me that he was going to do me in, well, I ain't going to give him that chance. I'm going to nail him. One way or another, I'm going to put that man down. So you watch what you said here. For 29 years, Alcatraz reigned as America's Devil's Island. But the story of this prison begins long before it became a federal penitentiary. When Spanish explorers first entered San Francisco Bay in the 1700s, they charted a barren island inhabited only by thousands of pelicans. They named it Isla de los Alcatraces, Island of Pelicans. Early settlers of the city paid little attention to the island that was best known for its deep covering of bird droppings. They nicknamed it Guano Island. However, the U.S. Army recognized Alcatraz as an excellent location for protecting the harbor of San Francisco. In 1853, they began the daunting task of building a fort and a lighthouse on the desolate island. Fortified gun emplacements were constructed for cannon that weighed up to seven and a half tons. A 20-foot high defensive wall stretched more than 500 feet. The entire rounded top of the island was leveled to a plateau to accommodate the barracks building known as the Citadel. Finally, by the end of 1859, the post on Alcatraz Island was opened. Alcatraz was cutting edge technology for army fortresses during the 1860s. At its height, when the Civil War ended, Alcatraz had 129 cannon mounted on it, which is uh, more than Fort Sumter and Fort Pulaski, the famous East Coast uh, battlefield forts combined. It mounted five guns that could fire 15 inch diameter cannonballs weighing 440 pounds, ranges up to three miles. Like all forts, Alcatraz had its guardhouse for soldiers who broke the law. But early on, the army realized the jail could be expanded to become an escape-proof prison for the military's hardcore offenders. In 1861, Alcatraz was designated the main army prison west of the Mississippi. Over the years, it held up to 600 inmates. As the prison population grew, a wooden cell house was constructed with cells no bigger than closets. By the early 1900s, the fort had become obsolete as a defensive position, but the prison thrived. In 1907, Fort Alcatraz was officially closed, but a new state-of-the-art prison facility was constructed, a building that eventually would evolve into Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. The cell house was the largest steel reinforced concrete structure in the world, containing three three tiered cell blocks. It was designed to hold 600 prisoners, one man per cell. Each cell was equipped with running water, a toilet, and forced air ventilation. A cast iron spiral staircase gave access to the upper tiers. Beneath the new prison remained the hallways from the original Citadel building. Punishment cells were created in this grim setting, where men were chained to the floor in complete darkness, offered only bread and water. After 14 days in solitary, the broken men would emerge, thankful to return to their cells. 
Through the 1920s, the inmate population at the military prison averaged about 400 men. But once the Depression hit, it was deemed too costly for the Army to maintain. However, Alcatraz would fit perfectly into the plans of the new Federal Bureau of Prisons. In the early 1930s, the nation was beset with hoodlums and organized crime figures, uh, the Al Capones and the Machine Gun Kellys, bank robbers and kidnappers and bootleggers and gangsters and gamblers and what have you that uh, were, were uh, very high profile. They were dominating the headlines. And the federal government had to do something about it, uh, something equally high profile to show that uh, there was a response to this wave of crime. And one of the responses was to establish a prison that would define hard time. The head of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Sanford Bates, along with his assistant and successor, James Bennett, hoped that by separating the notorious criminals, the troublemakers, and the escape risks, the entire prison system would operate more smoothly. In 1933, the Justice Department took control of the military prison. Extensive renovations were launched to make Alcatraz even more secure. The flat, soft steel cell bars were replaced with tool-proof steel. Gun galleries with steel bars were built at the ends of the cell house so armed guards could keep watch. Metal detectors were installed, and outside, six guard towers were erected. Chain-link fence was added, and barbed wire was strung. In all, 336 cells were refurbished, and on July 1st, 1934, Alcatraz was declared open. The first inmates were 32 of the most incorrigible prisoners from the military prison. On August 11th, 1934, 14 inmates were transferred in from McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. A week later, a special prison train left Atlanta Federal Penitentiary with 53 hardcore felons, including Al Capone. For absolute security, when the train arrived in San Francisco, the entire car was shipped to the island by barge. Finally, the last mass shipment came from Leavenworth with 102 men, including Machine Gun Kelly. The bold experiment had begun. The question now was, could Alcatraz impose its will on 200 of the nation's toughest criminals? This is Broadway, the central corridor in the Alcatraz cell house. It is flanked by the two main cell blocks, B and C, each three tiers high with five by nine foot cells. A block was never refurbished after the army left and was rarely used by the federal penitentiary. D block became the area for isolation cells and solitary confinement. Warden James Johnston implemented the strict policies set forth by the Bureau of Prisons. And just as they hoped, Word of the harsh conditions at this new penitentiary reverberated through the prison system. Of course, you hear a lot of rumors about Alcatraz because I was in another federal penitentiary. I was up at McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. And uh, they threatened me for approximately 10 years, gonna send me to Alcatraz. But uh, back in them days, I didn't care about nothing. You couldn't threaten me with nothing. I told them what they could do with their Alcatraz. Leon Whitey Thompson was serving 15 years for bank robbery. He was shipped to Alcatraz in 1958. I got worked over pretty good at McNeil Island by a couple of guards. From then on, all I live for now is I'm going to put one or both of them guards in a grave. And I didn't care at the time if I hit the grave with him, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get me a guard, a couple of guards, and that's what got me sent to Alcatraz. Jim Quillen was serving 45 years for kidnapping. He was transferred to Alcatraz in 1942 and spent 10 years on the rock. 
I was sent here because I was 22 years old. I was a high escape risk. I had escaped from every place I'd ever been. And I was very bitter and angry and very combative. So um, they weren't going to keep me in an institution where rehabilitation was the main factor uh, because I wasn't ready for it. At Alcatraz, the dehumanizing process began immediately. They do some things that try to humiliate you. And they brought us into where the visiting room was. And they stripped off the prison clothes that I wore from McNeil Island. They stripped them off, and they, uh, they uh, give you the finger wave. You know what the finger wave is. And uh, they go to all the cavities of your body. It's more or less to degrade you because uh, we didn't come in contact with nobody on our trip from McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary to Alcatraz. You had four rights. You had food, clothing, shelter, and medical care. Those were rights. Aside from that, anything else was a privilege. Work was a privilege. Um, mail was a privilege. Visits were a privilege. Everything was a privilege. Uh, they wouldn't force you to work, but if you didn't work, you spent 23 out of 24 hours in the cell. If you worked, you were out of a cell for seven hours, which is a big gap in your day. And it lets you develop some camaraderie with other guys, although they were never close because you never trusted anybody. There were no newspapers, magazines, or radios allowed. Privileges also included books from the library and movies twice a month. Recreation was permitted for just a few hours on the weekends. If an inmate broke the rules, he lost privileges. For serious infractions, he was sent to the isolation area where he would remain in his cell 24 hours a day. For more severe violations, he was sent to solitary confinement. Until 1939, Warden Johnston used the dungeons of the military prison for solitary, but eventually six special cells were constructed on D-Block, and these became known as the Hole. Every time I went to the Hole, I went for 19 consecutive days. You never brushed your teeth. You never had a bath. You never changed your clothes. Now, the Bureau of Prisons policy theoretically was that there would be light in there. Uh, that's a fallacy. There was no light. It was total blackness. The mess hall was considered a potential trouble spot, so meals were restricted to 20 minutes, limiting the possibility of inmate unrest or violence. The dining hall, like any other part of Alcatraz, was quite strict. They would be marched in, uh, double filed down to the uh, steam table, pick up the food. Everything they took on the plate, they had to eat. If they did not eat everything on the plate, they did not eat the next meal. It was very strict. The eating utensils were kept there on the table. Uh, if I was assigned to the dining room, I'd watch maybe two or three tables at one time and I'd make sure as they filed out that all their utensils were there in my sight. If I couldn't see all those utensils, we would stop that line and we would search all the inmates. The mess hall was also equipped with tear gas canisters dotted along the ceiling. We used to call uh, the chow hall, we used to call that the gas chamber. And uh, once in a while, something would come down, and their orders were to press the button and release the tear gas in there. But they never did release the tear gas. The reason why is if they ever pressed that button and released that tear gas on us, them guards that are in that chow hall, they were dead. They were dead. They knew that them guards, if they ever pressed that button, them guards would be killed in a minute. Originally, talking was not allowed at Alcatraz. But that rule was unenforceable and eventually scrapped. Over the years, inmates developed their own secret system of communicating with one another. You and I are rapid, and uh, 
There's a guard coming down the tier, and uh, we're talking. And I say to you, cool the phrase, the Fiendifong, he's on a lope. You know what I said? Cool the phrase. In other words, shut up the talk. The Fiendifong, the hack, the guard is on the lope. He's coming down the walk. And the guards never knew what the hell we were talking about, but we had to, this little language between ourselves. Monotony and boredom were synonymous with life on the rock, and most former inmates agree it was more difficult to deal with than the physical conditions of Alcatraz. Another aspect of the psychological torment was the beautiful view of the city of San Francisco and freedom. Well, the very proximity of San Francisco to the island really played havoc with you mentally. You could see a whole panoramic view when you went to the yard. Uh, if you lived in certain areas, you could look out and see the lights at night. If the wind was from the right direction, um, you could hear the girls on the dock. You could hear the music from Aquatic Park. Um, you could smell the chocolate from the chocolate factory. And uh, they, all play, they all tend to uh, drive you over the edge. And I made it a policy never to have a cell that looked out. Uh, and I never used to look at the city. I never sit on the steps and look out at the city uh, because I knew I couldn't handle it. Inmates on Alcatraz reacted differently to the harsh conditions. Some accepted it, others rebelled. Some were driven insane, while others became obsessed with escape. When an inmate was sent to the rock, there was no possibility of parole. If he demonstrated that he was truly a changed man, he could be transferred back to another prison to possibly earn a parole there. This policy, along with the harsh life on the rock, led many inmates to dream of breaking out. But everyone knew the reputation of this prison. Alcatraz was escape-proof. Any man that attempted escape from Alcatraz is a man that's committing suicide. This is a man that's given up. This is a man that feels he has no future. He's gonna wind up dying in prison, so why not take a shot at it? Security was tight. The ratio of guards to inmates was much higher than in other prisons, about one officer for every three prisoners. The inmates were officially counted 12 times a day, but each guard was expected to do his own counts every 15 minutes. If an inmate managed to make it to the water, the swim to freedom was only about a mile. However, deadly currents and 50 degree water made the swim extremely difficult. Trained swimmers have often accomplished the feat, but for most prisoners, it appeared virtually impossible. During the 29 years of operation, a total of 14 escape attempts were made, involving 36 inmates. Nearly a third of them either died trying or were later executed in the gas chamber. Joe Bowers made the first escape attempt on April 27, 1936. The first escape attempt probably was a suicide, more than an escape attempt. Joe Bowers, who was regarded by a lot of prisoners as being a little bit crazy, uh, tried to climb a fence in full view of a tower guard, who, of course, shouted out some warnings. Bowers kept climbing the fence. They shouted out again, and they warned him, and he kept climbing the fence, and they had no choice but to shoot at him. And they shot him, and he dropped down the other side. Jim Quillen was another inmate determined to escape. My first seven and a half years here were concentrating on escaping. This was my home. I swam in the bay. The water didn't frighten me. I was a good, strong swimmer. I was only 25 years old. I really thought that I could beat the water, and I still, to this day, believe I could have. Quillen tried to break out through a steam tunnel in the kitchen basement. It was three by three. It was so small that you couldn't turn around in it. 
All the hot steam pipes from the powerhouse come up through there, and the temperature ranged anywhere from 145 to 165 degrees. But we thought that we could go from here to the powerhouse and then to the water. We had been outsmarted, and they'd poured a five-foot piece of concrete between here and the powerhouse. Quillen was caught and sent to the hole for 19 days, and then de-blocked for a year. The bloodiest escape attempt made headlines in May of 1946, when six inmates took nine officers hostage in the main cell house. The violent episode led to the death of seven men and became known as the Battle of Alcatraz. The leader of the ill-fated attempt was Bernard Coy, a Kentucky bank robber obsessed with escape. He believed there was a weakness in the bars in the gun gallery where an armed guard stood watch over the cell house. Coy designed and built a bar spreading device that he hoped would gain him access to the guard's arsenal. He worked as an orderly in the cell house and carefully monitored the daily activities of the guards. A key to Coy's plan was the movement of officer Ernest Lagesson. My father was the officer in charge of the cell house. And Coy had determined that the time for this break would be when my father went to lunch. Um, because at that point, there would only be one officer on the floor of the cell house. On May 2nd, at around 1.40 p.m., Coy made his move. He and Marvin Hubbard overpowered the one guard and let their four accomplices out of their cells. Coy then covered his body in grease, climbed the gun gallery, spread the bars, and squirmed inside. He surprised the gallery officer and overpowered him as well. Coy grabbed a 45, a rifle, and every key he could find. Unfortunately for him, the one key he desperately needed that could have opened the cell block wasn't among them. The escapees tried every key, but none would open the door to freedom. The locks were designed so that if an improper key was used in the lock, the lock would become dysfunctional. So by using repeatedly wrong keys, they eventually destroyed the lock, so there was no way they were going to get that door open. Meanwhile, Joe Kretzer, a former public enemy number five, along with other SKPs, were taking officers hostage as the guards rushed in to investigate the disturbance. Officer Lagesson and eight others were locked in the two cells at the end of Block C. Officers tried unsuccessfully for hours to free the hostages, hurling tear gas and exchanging gunfire with the rioters. While the drama unfolded inside Alcatraz, a fascinated public and media kept constant vigil. By now, Kretzer and Coy had exhausted all their possibilities for getting the cell house door open. They were overheard saying, we're going out the hard way. A frustrated Kretzer began shooting the hostages in the cells and leaving the officers to die. One of the other escapees, Sam Shockley, realized Officer Lagesson had not been hit and implored Kretzer to shoot them all. They'll testify against us. But Kretzer was reluctant to kill Officer Lagesson. They were friends. They were friends. And Kretzer said, well, that's Mr. Lagesson. He's a friend of mine. Shockley insisted that Kretzer should finish the job. So Kretzer raised the gun and set it on the bars and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Lagesson. And he pulled the trigger, and the gun was empty. It just clicked. So he put in a new clip and fired. And he missed him. I mean, he's barely creased his cheek from a distance of four feet. I don't know if he was trying to shoot him or not. Lagesson then played dead on the cell floor until the hostages were freed by a rescue team eight hours later. The Battle of Alcatraz raged for two days. Finally, Marines dropped powerful concussion grenades into the cell house. Three of the escapees retreated to their cells, but Coy, Kretzer, and Hubbard hid in a utility corridor to make their last stand. 
Eventually, officers sprayed the corridor with bullets, killing all of them. In the end, two officers had been killed and 14 wounded. Of the three remaining SKPs, two were executed in the gas chamber. The third was spared because he was just 19 years old. After this fearsome episode, no one dared an escape attempt from Alcatraz for another 10 years. Alcatraz was a surprisingly small prison. Its inmate population averaged only about 260 men. The typical maximum security penitentiary holds more than 1,500. Throughout its history, 1,545 men had the dubious honor of doing time at the federal penitentiary. Many famous names were admitted to Alcatraz, but the prison usually did its job of reducing each of them to just another number. I give you a picture of my mugshot. You can take a look on that mugshot. You will not see my name on that nameplate. You'll see a number. You could take a look on any other mugshot and you'll see the name on there with it. But this is the only prison that I've ever been in where my name was a number. Number 85 was the legendary crime czar, Al Capone. Allegedly, Capone had managed to run his operations from other prisons, but things changed when he got to Alcatraz. At Alcatraz, he apparently tried to uh, maneuver his way around the warden, but was completely prohibitive from doing so, and he became the cell house sweep. To my mind, one of the worst jobs, because you don't, you hardly leave the cell house. When Capone arrived in 1934, his advancing syphilis had begun to destroy his mental capacities. By 1939, overcome by the disease, he was transferred out. Number 117 was George Machine Gun Kelly, who was part of the first shipment from Leavenworth. He was college educated and from a wealthy Memphis family. He began as a bootlegger in the 1920s, but moved on to bank robbery to impress his girlfriend and future wife, Kate Shannon. In 1933, the couple was convicted for kidnapping millionaire Charles Urschel. But Kelly would become a changed man at Alcatraz. Kelly was probably our, our best inmate we had here, probably ever on Alcatraz. You might have been more of a bank president than a bank robber the way he acted, the way he talked, even the way he dressed in his prison garb. He worked here in the laundry area. He was a clerk, so he was able to get his clothing real pressed and everything. And he was just a, a, just a real nice guy. It's amazing, you know, from his reputation, you think he's a terrible man, but actually he was probably one of our best ones. Very nice guy, as far as I was concerned. I think if you go back and research Kelly's wife, you'll find out that his wife, Catherine, was a motivating force behind all the things that Kelly did. Uh, she apparently was a very beautiful girl. Carol, Kelly was madly in love with her, and she wanted him to rob these banks so she could have the nice things. And he was stupid enough to do it. Number 325 was Alvin Creepy Carpus the FBI's first public enemy number one. He was convicted of shooting a policeman and kidnapping the brewery millionaire, William Hamm. Carpus spent 26 years on Alcatraz, longer than any other inmate. Unlike Machine Gun Kelly, he was hated by the staff and the other prisoners. Carpus was creepy. I worked with him in the bakery for about three years. Uh, on a couple occasions, had problems with him. Uh, Carpus with a gun may have been uh, potentially very dangerous. As an individual, man to man, he wasn't. Another notorious inmate was number 594, Robert Stroud, better known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. Stroud's public perception is filled with myth. 
the Birdman never actually kept birds at Alcatraz. At Leavenworth Penitentiary, he had created a bird menagerie, conducted research, and had written books. But once transferred to Alcatraz in 1942, he was never again allowed to keep birds. In reality, Stroud was far from the kindly old gentleman portrayed by Burt Lancaster in the Hollywood movie. He was highly intelligent, but he was also a dangerous sociopath and double murderer. He was kept in solitary confinement for 43 years because of his crimes and his violent behavior in prison. From my point of view, he was a manipulator. He was a conniver. He liked chaos. He liked turmoil. Um, yet he was, uh, physically, he was a coward as far as I was concerned. Stroud continually instigated fights and riots, so he was transferred to a special cell created just for him in the prison hospital. He would spend his remaining 11 years at Alcatraz in these quarters, totally isolated from other prisoners. Morton Sobel was one of the few inmates sentenced directly to Alcatraz. In 1951, he was convicted of espionage along with Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The Rosenbergs were sent to Sing Sing's electric chair for selling atomic bomb secrets to the Russians. So Bell was given 30 years at the Rock. Of course, the reason I'm here today is because at the trial, the government did not connect me up with the atom bomb. And that, that was the difference between the death penalty and the 30 years that I got. So Bell wasn't the typical hardcore convict at Alcatraz, but he developed a unique camaraderie with the other inmates. Generally, my reception by the other men was quite warm for two reasons. One, they, mine was a whole pro, whole high profile case. And they knew from their experience that the FBI had put pressure on me. And I had resisted the FBI pressure. The other thing, your rating is determined also by your sentence. Since I had 30 years, that raised my rating. The extent of the bond between men on Alcatraz became most evident for Sobel when his friends, the Rosenbergs, died in the electric chair. When Julius and Ethel executed, the first one that told me about it was a guard. And he told it to me in a way not of a guard talking to an inmate, but person to person. And then the next morning, when I got up, the inmates had all learned about it. The men came over and told me how sorry they were that my rap partners had been executed. And their concern was really heartfelt. These were people who were supposed to be hardened criminals, but in this respect, that hardness disappeared, and they were just one concerned person talking to another. And it, it affected me deeply to find them all so moved by such an event. Maintaining a prison on Alcatraz Island was complicated and expensive. To house an inmate cost roughly $14 a day compared to the federal average of $5.40. There was no water on the island, so it had to be shipped in by barge and stored in tanks. Electricity was supplied by an antiquated DC power plant built in the early 1900s. By the early 1960s, the prison was decaying badly and the cost to rebuild it would have been exorbitant. The Bureau of Prisons was already thinking of closing the infamous facility when a highly publicized escape brought attention to the deteriorating conditions on the rock. On July 11, 1962, Frank Morris and two brothers, John Anglin and Clarence Anglin, staged a remarkably ingenious breakout. Their attempt inspired the Clint Eastwood movie, Escape from Alcatraz. The men realized the walls that held them were deteriorating, so they set out to enlarge the vents in the backs of their cells. 
They dug for nine months with an impressive array of homemade tools. Some were created from spoons stolen in the mess hall. They even managed to create an electric drill from a vacuum cleaner motor. As their digging progressed, they disguised the work with fake vents built from notebook cardboard and paper mache. They built paddles for moving through the water, a bar spreader and a wrench, and a periscope to see around corners. Referencing an article they found in Popular Mechanics magazine, they fashioned life preservers from rubber raincoats. For the finishing touch, they sculpted fake heads, which they placed in their beds so the guards would think they were asleep in their cells. Each man built a dummy head that, well, wasn't exactly high art, but it worked in a dark cell in the middle of the night. And uh, the heads were constructed out of uh, weird combinations of soap and concrete bits and plaster of Paris and hair that was uh, picked up off the barbershop floor. At around 9 p.m. on June 11th, the men placed their fake heads on their pillows and crawled out of their cells. They then climbed the utility corridor and broke out to the roof through an air shaft. I knew they were going out that night. We could hear them going up through the tunnel in between the cells. And when they hit that roof, hundreds of seagulls took off raising hell. I mean, they raised hell. And I thought, I told my buddy, I said, hey, Lou, I said, oh, man, they're busted now. Them seagulls raising hell. But nobody investigated. They were able to cross the roof of the cell house, went down a, a stove pipe, came out down to the shower room entrance, went over one set of uh, barbed wire, got down to the water, went over another set of barbed wire, and uh, went into the water on the east side of the island, facing Berkeley, probably sometime between 9 and 10 p.m. at night, and 7 o'clock the next morning. When the head count came, quite literally, um, uh, three inmates didn't get out of bed. a giant manhunt was launched. Several days later, some of their equipment and a plastic bag containing a money order in Anglin's name washed up on shore. But the three men were never found. Today, all three are listed as drowned and presumed dead. But officially, the case remains open. I'd like to sit here and tell you that Morris, John, and Clarence, and them guys, they made it, but they didn't. I know in my heart they didn't. Uh, the bones is probably still out in that bay somewhere. In 1963, Attorney General Robert Kennedy finally ordered the closure of Alcatraz Penitentiary, and the last of the prisoners left the island on March 21st of that year. In November of 1969, Native Americans from several different tribes claimed the island as Indian land, citing a little-known treaty that allowed them to take over any abandoned federal territory. The Indians planned to convert the island into a Native American educational and cultural complex. However, vandalism and arson marred the efforts. During the occupation, Five buildings were gutted by fire, including the warden's house and the lighthouse. After 18 months of occupation, the remaining Indians were removed from the island by federal marshals. In 1972, Alcatraz became part of the national park system. Today, it hosts more than a million tourists every year. As visitors tour the prison, they gain a sense of life on the rock but can one ever truly appreciate what the inmates endured? Jim Quillen left Alcatraz in 1952, a reformed man. He went on to raise a family and enjoy a successful career as an X-ray technician, but the memory of Alcatraz never faded. I would have never, never, never have let the law bring me back to prison. But what Alcatraz did to me was it made me hard in some aspects, 
that uh, I could never face a future of this again. And I wouldn't do it. I would die before I'd do it. Whitey Thompson spent 24 years in jail and five years on Alcatraz. Since his release, he has lectured to young people, warning them of the horrible realities of prison life. Thompson has been offered pardons for his past crimes, but he has always declined. I stopped and thought about all the people that worked in them banks. When I went in there, ramming that sword off shotgun into them, double barrel shotgun. How did it affect them people all these years later on down the road? I interrupted their lives and I had no right to do this. So who am I today to accept a pardon when they never got a pardon? That's the only thing that bothers me today. I'm 74 years old, is I, I think of people that I hurt. I interrupted their lives I had no right to do that. So how can I accept the pardon? How can I be honest with myself and accept one when they never got none? 